find out what is the meaning of the phrase, the laws of nature and of nature's God, spoken of by Thomas Jefferson. I want you to tell me everything there is to know about that. Defending Utah covers the stories others are just too often afraid to touch. They don't nibble around the edges when it comes to pointing out threats to our liberty. They're not afraid to name names and call out organizations. This is Defending Utah Radio. Every Friday morning at 9 on K Talk 1640. Defending Utah. Think right and wrong, not right and left. Join Defending Utah because if you're not already on a government watch list, you should be. Okay, James Madison, and the lesson we're dealing with here is natural law, the moral basis of a free society. My life was changed in a town not far from here. I lived in Pleasant Grove, Utah. And it was half my life ago, half my life has been, been, been different. I was 35 years old then, and in, in Lehigh, I lived in Pleasant Grove, and in Lehigh, my neighbor in Pleasant Grove said, there's going to be a lecture series. And I thought, oh my, you know, I've been, I, I have a graduate degree, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an educated man, I, do I really need to go to a lecture somewhere? Well, it's going to be really interesting, and this neighbor was quite, you know, encouraging, and he says, it's in Melvin Anderson's shop. Now, I didn't know what his shop looked like, you know. What are we doing lecturing in a shop? That's his shop. And I love Melvin Anderson for letting his shop be used. I don't, I mean, Melvin, are you here today? <laughs> He's my dear, dear friend all these years. And, and so my neighbor was quite, you know, he just wanted me to come to hear this lecture. Some of you are here today for the same reason your neighbor invited you. And I tried to get out of it, and I remember saying, does it cost anything? Because I wasn't very well off. I was the one that needed the book for free off the table. And, and, and he said, well, uh, yeah, it's $35, but it's 11 weeks, three hours a night for 11 weeks. Oh, I, I can't afford it. I'll pay your way. And I'll be over at a quarter to seven to pick you up. <laughs> that's how we build an audience. David, that's the solution right there. Each of these people need to say, next, next Friday night and next Saturday, say it to your friends and neighbor, there's no charge, and I'll be over at a quarter to seven to pick you up. And that's how we gain strength. Liberty and learning. Nothing can be more noble than that. That's where my life changed. I went through that little aluminum door, and I sat down in a cold folding chair and listened for three hours. Now, the old professor was really old. 65. He had a bald head and showed a little bit of sign of aging. And I sat there and listened at age 35, and when he was done, I went up and I said, I don't know you. You don't know me. But what do I have to teach for you? I felt something that night. I felt the Spirit of God in my heart as he told the story of America. Now, that's what you need to feel. If you're going to study American heritage, you need to feel that God has a role in this. This land has a destiny. We have a purpose to fulfill. We need to send good people out throughout the world to make this world a better place. If you believe in the prophecies and believe in Abraham and the promises to Abraham, that's all part of the story that should be part of America. Well, that's where my life, my life was changed. I went there faithfully once a week for 11 weeks and listened for three hours. And then the old man, about two years later, as I continued to study, I asked him, I asked him at one point, what do I have to do to be a, a good teacher? Oh, he says, read yourself full and speak from the overflow. Oh, you've got to read books, huh? Yeah, yeah, you got to read. And oh, I started reading. Now I encourage you to read also. We have a table of good books still back there, no junk. My son said, Dad, I'd read if it was less than 50 pages. So I have some back there that are less than 50 pages. Brian Meekham, standing back in the corner. I asked Brian one day, what was it that brought you in, got you interested in the cause of liberty? What did you tell me, Brian? See if you're consistent. It's this right here. That's all he read. He got interested in the cause of liberty. It's this little thin piece of paper. It's the story of Davy Crockett meeting Horatio Bunce out in a field, written in 1881. Be sure and take that with you today. More current, How Tyranny Came to America by Joseph O'Brien. Less than 50 pages. This fits the qualification for my son. This old man was the man I met. 
That'd be a Cleon Scousen. What is the mean? Oh, I went to work for him. That story right there was after two years of studying and doing my homework and reading books, one day he says, why don't you come to work for me? I got too many invitations. I can't keep up with them all. Man, he says, if you could just take some of my speaking engagements, well, I can't speak for you. I, I can't go to work for you. Why not? I don't have a suit. So he says, ah, and he got out his checkbook and wrote out a blank check and signed it. Gave me a blank check. He says, go to a suit store. Buy a suit, any suit you want. Just come to work. And I, I still have that old suit. And the day before they buried him, I gave a speech in St. George in the tabernacle, and I wore the old suit, tattered and threadbare, pockets all wore out, I put it on in honor of that great man. Well, he says, after I started working for him, I want you to do an assignment. This was my first assignment. Go find out what is the meaning of the phrase, the laws of nature and of nature's God, spoken of by Thomas Jefferson. I want you to tell me everything there is to know about that. Well, you know, it wasn't until later I figured out he already knew. It was me he wanted to find out, for me, what the meaning was. When I did that research, it was a great experience, and it launched me in, this, in the area of study, learning. I went, what do you do when you're going to study that? Where do you go? I had a graduate degree. I was supposed to know what study was and how do you research. And I thought, the laws of nature, simple. I'll go to the law library. It was a wonderful choice. The laws of nature, they had no computers then, it was all in cards, little paper cards and big card piles. And I looked up every reference there was pertaining to anything to do with law of nature, nature's God, any reference, and there were numerous references. It took about six weeks of filtering through the library to read everything in the BYU Law Library. And then I went and did it at the University of Utah Law Library, <laughs> be sure I hadn't missed anything. It was a great experience. That's what this lesson today will cover. In 1981, we published for the first time this book, The 5,000 Year Leap, and then we put out a new edition in 2006. In March of 2009, it reached national number one bestseller, and we were thrilled to have that happen to a history book. Just unbelievable. A lot of interest in the content. It contains the 28 principles of liberty. We called it Principles of Freedom 101. If we were to follow these principles, the sun would rise on America again. The first principle is the only reliable basis for sound government and just human relations is natural law. And that's where my research had taken me. The laws of nature and of nature's God very simply boiled down, and I learned this from a lawyer named Herb Titus. He was speaking at a convention where I was one of the speakers in Cincinnati, Ohio, about three years ago. And he says, let's boil it down to the very simple elements, the laws of nature and of nature's God, God's will revealed in nature, God's will revealed in the Holy Scriptures. And so when we speak of our Declaration of Independence in that beautiful phrase, we're referring back to our Heavenly Father. It is biblical indeed, Romans chapter 2. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. And so even though the law hasn't been taught to them by some person here on the earth, God has placed the law in the hearts of his children. The Spirit of Christ, some people call it. In the Old Testament we read, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And so the laws of nature and of nature's God are biblical principles. In this book, chapter four, two kinds of law, Richard Maybury points out that we can give them names. He calls the laws of nature and of nature's God that have been discovered. You think we've discovered all of the laws of God? <laughs> no. And so he says, as we discover them, we can call them scientific law. That's Richard Maybury's use of the term, and it's, it's a good term, a good use. And he says the laws are, that are made up by man that are not based upon the laws of nature and of nature's God, those laws, he says, we'll call them political laws. They're two different kinds of law. In his definition, he says, 
verbal or math mathematical expressions of natural law discovered through observation, study, and experimentation. And after they practiced these kinds of discoveries for many, many years, and this is certainly over in our, our England, for example, when they discovered a law of nature as God and practiced it for a long time, it became so common that they called it common law. It was common to everyone. They didn't need to have it written down. They just all knew that thou shalt not kill was common, common law. Well, the political law is made up law. Law based on the whims of man. Human law. Whatever serves the interest of the state. This Defending Utah broadcast is brought to you in part by KTalk Radio AM 1640, Black Lotus Web Development, blacklotuswebdev.com, the United States Constitution Made Easy to Understand by Dr. Lonnie Crockett, available at the Defending Utah Liberty Store, Shem Financial Services, 801-856-6151, Trust Plumbing, 801-808-5470, Higher Calling Firearms, highercallingfirearms.com, Pioneer Family Scholars, American Appliance, 801-254-2566, and Anderson Accounting, 801-225-0396. It's a fact. More photos of you are being taken than ever before. Are you ashamed of your smile? At last, a new technology that gives a brighter and healthier smile in under two hours. And it's fully warranted, so you'll never have to worry about your smile again. Call Dr. Jeremy Thompson at Thompson Dental, 801 801- 254-0835 or visit gonewsmile.com and we'll show you how you can restore your faded, yellowed, or worn teeth without surgery, crowns, or implants. And it's backed by a 30-day, 100% satisfaction money-back guarantee. This scientific breakthrough will painlessly transform your appearance in one visit. The smile you've been waiting for will never cost less or look brighter than it will today. Call 801 801- 254-0835 or visit gonewsmile.com that's g-o-n-u smile.com to revitalize your smile new smile it looks good on you british common law this is a famous painting the man in the background on the judge's seat is sir william blackstone a great beloved judge wise and prudent in his decisions and here the lawyers before him are trying to argue a certain case and the piece of furniture in between they called the bench. And so we have uh, Betrayed by the Bench is the name of one of our books that would be well. Do you have that on the table, Steve, Betrayed by the Bench? That, that's a good book to go with this lesson also uh, by John Stormer out in Missouri. John Stormer, is a, his ministry is serving in the prison, teaching prisoners the gospel of Jesus Christ. The foundation of common law is very elementary. Do all you have agreed to do. Do not encroach on other persons or their property. Now, when I was a child, they taught me, keep your promises, don't hit other people or take their stuff. Now, this is just common law. This is how fundamental it is. Sir William Blackstone believed in the common law, and he wrote the book Commentaries on the Law, which was a book on common law, natural law. And in that book, he writes... Man as a creature must necessarily be subject to the laws of his creator. This will of his maker is called the law of nature. No human laws are of any validity contrary to this. Now think about that for a moment. Up in Salt Lake City, we have a group we call our legislature. What if they pass a law that violates the natural law? Well, Sir William Blackstone says, no human laws are of any validity if contrary to the laws of nature. Or if back in Washington, D.C., they pass a law that violates the, the laws of nature, do they ever do that? Almost all the laws they pass violate the laws of nature's God. Have you ever heard of the law of nature's God, thou shalt not steal? You've heard of that one, haven't you? Well, it turns out that thou shalt not steal applies to governments also, and they cannot take unjustly what does not belong to them. So they're violating the laws of nature's God. No validity, if contrary to this. This famous painting we see that represents the signing of the Declaration of Independence, although they didn't do it on July the 4th. This is the, the Declaration of Independence is the legal basis of our Constitution. They go together. 
You don't have the declaration and shove it off to the side and then say, this is the Constitution, we follow it. The declaration gives the legal basis for having a Constitution. The laws of nature and of nature's God, spoken of in the Declaration of Independence, is the foundation for creating self-government by the consent of the governed. Cicero believed in natural law. Now, this is a long time ago, 65 B.C. True law is right reason in agreement with nature. A legislative majority may pass laws that contradict the natural law, but these no more deserve to be called laws than the rules a band of robbers might pass in their assembly. So if the state legislature passes a law that violates natural law, they're no better than a band of robbers. It's pretty strong language, isn't it? This is the first Supreme Court building. Uh, interesting construction. The bottom part was where you pulled your carriage in and, and left your livestock down below as you went upstairs to do your work. And uh, they met there. And at that time, they were practicing what we call rule of law. Now, today, the, the, the phrase is still used. They say rule of law. You'll hear, like I remember George Bush said it a few times, we're practicing rule of law. Well, it's different now. We're not really practicing rule of law based on the laws of nature and of nature's God. We're practicing political law, and we're calling it rule of law. That's what's going on today. When the rule of law was practiced, it had these different names. Now, we've introduced you to them. Let's summarize them here. Sometimes it was called natural law, and as it was discovered, it was called scientific law. And when it was practiced for a long time, it was called common law. This is the very, very basic explanation. It's good for us to try and understand things by writing definitions. You, you write your own statement of a book. You ever do a book report? You have to do a book report in school. They do that nowadays. Some, sure. I, I wrote this, this definition, and I invite you to do your own. Study something and then brief it down. Put it into a short statement and write it down. Okay, this is my statement of rule of law. Because the United States is a constitutional republic, both the people and their elected leaders observe the limitations imposed by a written constitution, which is solidly founded on the laws of nature and of nature's God. Now you try your own and you'll learn as you, as you read, study, and then write it down. That in contrast to what's happening in the United States Supreme Court today, they're practicing today what we would call rule of law makers instead of rule of law. This is called political law. It's law by the whims of man. Ancient Rome is one of the Richard Mayberry series, How It Affects You Today. In that book, he puts this illustration. This is the basic style of Roman architecture signifying statism. It is typical of government buildings throughout Western civilization. The style is derived from the temples to the mythical gods. And so the temples to the mythical gods look like this. Yeah, that's, that's common architecture today. Rule of lawmakers can also be called Roman law. Now, Roman law I first came across when I was studying the works of a great Utah scholar named J. Reuben Clark. Do you remember that name? He's long since deceased, but he, he has a wonderful legacy of great teachings and great speeches. He gave more than 125 speeches on the Constitution. And his, one of his speeches focused on Roman civil law, what it is. Well, Roman law, or the rule of lawmakers, or political law, they're all names for the same thing. In this Soldier's Guide of 1952, they have an excellent definition of Roman civil law. Now, they didn't know that's what they were describing. It's just that I read this, this particular guide, and it just jumped out. That's a definition of political law or Roman civil law. Here it is, quoting from page 69. Because the United States is a democracy, the majority of the people decide how our government will be organized and run. The people do this by electing representatives, and these men and women then carry out the wishes of the people. You see any problems with that? This is a de definition of Roman civil law or political law. First of all, are we a democracy? No, that's false. The majority of the people decide how our government will be. Is that how it works? 
Did the majority of the people whimsically, do we just say, well, let's have a democracy, let's vote. What, what should we do today? Oh, we need a better health care program. We need more uh, minimum wage. We have to raise that. We need more, and, and, and the whims of the fickle majority determine what the law is. Not based on anything that's firm, ascertainable, or anything to do with God or God's law. It's just the whims of man. This is represented in democracy. No better definition can be found. The rule of lawmakers undermines moral and religious values. Rewards sloth. Ah, rewards sloth. I mean, on the news yesterday, people are crying out for an extended, what is it, unemployment pay. We've got to have more unemployment pay. Well, after 90 months or whatever the unemployment pay is, they need another 90 months so they can... This, this pro rewards, rewards sloth. Promotes pornography and abortion. Roe versus Wade in the hall. They think of President Obama three days after he was elected. What did he announce? We will provide abortion funding for people throughout the world. Really? This is all part of the rule of lawmakers. Abolishes national boundaries. Think of what's going on now in the southern borders. Destroys the peace of the land. Undermines the right to private property. Redistributes the wealth promotes greater private and public debt, ignores all constitutional limitations. Now the list can go on, I ran out of screen. <laughs> These things are called the rule of lawmakers and they are all products of that form of government. How did we evolve from the rule of law to the rule of lawmakers? How did that happen? Now this next picture is gonna just grab you. You'll be fascinated with it. Did you know that I have a picture of your great-grandmother? Well, where did I get it? Well, we all have the same common great-grandmother according to the rule of lawmakers. And that grandmother looks like this. Huh? Yeah, what is that? Is that your grandma? Hmm. Are we simply a product of chance plus slime plus time? And you say, what does this have to do with natural law? Everything. We're going to show you the Darwinian influence on the law today and how we evolved from the rule of law to the rule of lawmakers. This story took place when I was a boy. And you probably have heard similar stories. At least I su I'm suppose the older set in here has heard stories something like this. Have you ever heard a story something like this? Far out in space. Now, I'm, I'm the little kid in the classroom. See? And my teacher says, far out in space, long time ago, there were particles floating around. And two of them bumped together, and they fell into a tepid primeval sea. And after eons of infinite time, a lizard crawled out from under a rock. That was your great-great-grandmother. You ever heard anything like that? Come on, admit it, you have. It's called, it's called evolution. They teach it in every school in the United States, as far as I can tell, every public school. This is directly out of my local public school textbook in Fillmore, Utah. This is the picture, and that's the sequence. The lizard would be off to the left, the slime further than that. It was eons of infinite time. Now, that's a long time ago. And over here on the right is your great-grandfather, or mother. I'm not sure which of that is. I went into prison a few months ago. It was five, a long time ago. The time passed. I was assigned when I was working as a scholar. I was assigned to do research on the prison system. And so I was told that the arrangements would be made for me to spend a week each night in the Utah State Penitentiary, eight hours. I go from four to midnight every, week, every night for a week. And that was an interesting experience. And as I did that, I got to, and the warden says, you can go anywhere you want, do anything you, anything you want, just don't pretend you're a prisoner or they'll kill you. Oh, thank you, thank you for the advice. I did, I went everywhere in the prison and the one guard says, don't walk up close to that guy. He'll throw urine out. He keeps his urine in a cup, and anybody who gets close, he throws it through the bars on you. I don't get the idea. And then the, then the warden says, you haven't really experienced prison life until you've done a cell count at 3 o'clock in the morning by yourself. Oh, that was fine. That was a really eerie lights coming through the windows. And he says, you have to see the skin. It doesn't count if you have a blanket with a bump under it. You know, the old thing, you roll, roll up a blanket, put your pillow on. So I had to pick the covers up, see if there was really a man in there. <laughs> anyway, that was my experience. One of those persons in the prison became my friend, and we had a good visit. And 
And I, he was an artist. And I said, I'd like you to draw me a picture. I'd like you to draw a picture of a man that feels he has no self-worth. He's just a product of random chance, and his great-grandmother was a lizard, and before that, a slime. Oh, he says, that's easy. You're just talking about a common street criminal. And so this is his illustration of a common street criminal. Here, here's, he, he, this is his same illustration, just embellished a bit more. Downtown Salt Lake City. Every night for a week, I was assigned to go on police duty with different kinds of police to, to do my, continuing my research on crime. And this is downtown Salt Lake City on one side of town. And now he says, oh, your cousin's coming to visit you. Now think about this. This is what he was taught. This is what the street criminal was taught, that his cousin was a monkey or an ape. And then he's just a product of random chance, just a piece of slime. How will that affect your behavior? Oh, you mean it makes a difference if I believe I'm a child of God and he has sent me here with a mission to fulfill versus being a slime? Yes, it makes a difference. This is the quotation from Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. Now, we're getting back to the law. I'm showing you how this ties together. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, one of the more prominent justices of the high court, declared, I see no reason for attributing to man a significance different in kind from that which belongs to a baboon or to a grain of sand. That's all you are, just a baboon or a grain of sand. Hmm, will that make a difference in your behavior? Let's see how that applied to the law. This is an illustration showing what it's like when there is no God and man is the center of the universe. We evolved from this lower form to where now we have this magnificent quality and ability to run the show. A long time ago, an old guru thought, beware of three dangers that can destroy us from within. This Defending Utah broadcast is brought to you in part by KTalk Radio AM 1640, Black Lotus Web Development, blacklotuswebdev.com, the United States Constitution Made Easy to Understand by Dr. Lonnie Crockett, available at the Defending Utah Liberty Store, Shem Financial Services, 801-856-6151, Trust Plumbing, 801-808-5470, Higher Calling Firearms, highercallingfirearms.com, Pioneer Family Scholars, American Appliance, 801-254-2566, and Anderson Accounting, 801-225-0396. It's a fact. More photos of you are being taken than ever before. Are you ashamed of your smile? At last, a new technology that gives a brighter and healthier smile in under two hours. And it's fully warranted, so you'll never have to worry about your smile again. Call Dr. Jeremy Thompson at Thompson Dental, 801 801- 254-0835 or visit gonewsmile.com and we'll show you how you can restore your faded, yellowed, or worn teeth without surgery, crowns, or implants. And it's backed by a 30-day, 100% satisfaction money-back guarantee. This scientific breakthrough will painlessly transform your appearance in one visit. The smile you've been waiting for will never cost less or look brighter than it will today. Call 801 801- 254-0835 or visit gonewsmile.com. That's G-O-N-U smile.com to revitalize your smile. New smile. It looks good on you. Those three dangers are beware of the flattery of prominent men. And I suppose we could put prominent women in there also. Beware of the flattery of prominent men. Beware of false educational ideas and beware of sexual impurity. The first two lead to the third one. If you have flattery of prominent men passed around and they're teaching false educational ideas, you will find the moral standards and values of the country will decline and we will engage in sexual impurity. I will illustrate that more. I make my living with my hands. I'm a blacksmith, uh, part of my skill, and, and uh, not a very good one, but I still make a living at it. And uh, it's not very good because I have other skills that I practice and I can't do them all as good as I'd like to. I'm a developing craftsman, that's what I am, David. David's been to my shop. Uh, we just made a, a, I wouldn't say a beautiful hand cart for the National Park Service. They're our good customers, 
and the hand cart is in the, just, just shipped it out. It was used at national, on a national special day for uh, the, the seashore, seashore National Monument just off the coast of North Carolina. A hand cart for search and rescue for saving the ships a hundred years ago. It's a historic piece of equipment or reenactment type thing. Uh, we built the printing press for the Benjamin Franklin print shop in Philadelphia. Beautiful machine, great big wooden printing press. And last week they sent me a, a print of the Declaration of Independence that they printed on our press there in Philadelphia in Independence Park. The only trouble is they typeset the, the headline wrong and we'll have to communicate with them on that. <laughs> this is one of my tools. Now I show you this to kind of break the, you know, break the monotony. This is called a flatter, this tool right here. And you can see how that, that uh, face on it's real shiny. That's the reflection of the anvil up into this mirror finish. That's a piece of polished steel. And they call this tool a flatter. Now, in the old days, a flatter was a, a, a Smith's forging tool with a broad, flat face. Now, what lecturer have you ever heard that knew what a flatter was? Flattery of prominent men comes from the word flatter. And here's how it evolved. This is how the flatter is used. That's my son demonstrating. The hot iron is on the anvil. He's striking the flatter with his hammer. And as he smashes down on the flatter, it makes the steel flatter. Yeah, that's how it works. Now, flattery comes from that. Webster's definition, flatter as a verb means from an older word, flatter. The older word is the tool, which meant to smooth. To raise hopes in, to encourage or please with hopeful or favorable, but sometimes unfounded or deceitful representations. Hence, to beguile. Flatter is to beguile. Oh, but I'm a blacksmith. In the blacksmith language, we call flattery smooth talk. Okay? Now we all know what smooth talk is. It sounds really good. Just don't believe it. Beware of three dangers that can destroy us from within. You tell me, what's the first one? Flattery of prominent men, false educational ideas, and sexual impurity. The three things that can destroy an individual or they can destroy a nation. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 21, by the way, I read every scriptural reference to the word flatter or flattery. That was a good project. It only takes a few minutes, 20 or 30 references. Look them all up. They're great. Here's one of them. A vile person shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. So the person's really vile that Daniel's referring to, but they look so good and they sound so good and they promise so many good things that we say, oh, he's a great God. Let's let him be our leader. And we choose people who are really trying to beguile us. Here is a list of people that qualify as beguilers. I don't know if they're bad people or good people. I can't judge that. All I can do is judge what they did. Now, you've heard of Charles Darwin. He wrote a book or two. Herbert Spencer promoted his material, popularized his theories. From then on, we have lawyer after lawyer, 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 lawyer. All of these lawyers embraced the doctrines of Darwin. And they came up with a concept called Darwinization of the law. Yeah, that's not my language. That's what I read in the books about the evolution of our law and how it came to be what it is today. They Darwinized it. They said, well, if, if man is a product of random chance, then the... No, they didn't start like that. They say, if man evolved from a lower form to a higher form, the law must also evolve. And they were using Darwin's thinking to pass it on to changing the law. So what was right yesterday could be wrong tomorrow. And what is wrong today might be right tomorrow because it has to evolve to a higher level. Have you ever heard anything so nonsensical? Pretty nonsensical, isn't it? Anyway, that's what they were trying to teach. These five lawyers are just a few of the men that promoted this concept. Now, what's this last person down here? Who's this guy right here? Alfred Kinsey. Who's he? If, if we give names, who is the father of our country? Come on. Say it again. George Washington. Either you're shy or your voice is weak. That's okay. You're shy. Who is the, who is the father of the Constitution? James Madison. Now, we all know that. Who is the father of sexual impurity? 
Alfred Kinsey. Now, I, I made that up. I've never heard any book say that, but everything he did, everything he promoted was impure and immoral. And so if we're going to give him a title, let's call him the father of sexual impurity, Alfred Kinsley, Kinsey. Fraudulent research was used by Alfred Kinsey to transform American law. He played a role in the lawmaking process by his fraudulent research. This, he used the term Darwinization of the law, it refers to how the law was evolved from natural law to political law. Darwinization of the law is sometimes called sociological jurisprudence. Fact, warping the Constitution undermines the rule of law. These men had been warping the Constitution for a long time, and women. The scene changes from time to time. New judges are appointed. They're about to put in Alina Kagan. And uh, right here we have a gentleman named Stephen Breyer, right here. Here's Clarence Thomas. We'll be referring back to them. And uh, right down here, Antoine Scalia. And we'll reference to him in a moment or two. Clarence Thomas. In a widely publicized magazine, he was quoted as saying, there are really only two ways to interpret the Constitution. Try to discern as best we can what the framers intended, or make it up. Okay? Now that's a, a justice of the Supreme Court speaking. He went on in that same explanation. Unless interpretive methodologies are tied to the original intent of the framers, they have no more basis in the Constitution than the latest football scores. Okay? Are the justices of the high court tying their decisions to the Constitution legitimately, not just in word? They'll say, oh, well, the Constitution allows us to do this because of the implied powers. That means it doesn't say it anywhere in the Constitution. They make it up. They just make it up, like Clarence Thomas explained. And it has no, no more relevance than the latest football scores. They, well, Clarence Thomas, in this picture, you notice, he is looking over at Stephen Breyer. Now, he's the only one that's not looking ahead. He's got a kind of a smile on his face, and I put these words in. I think he's thinking, they just make it up. <laughs> An essay on the trial by jury by Lysander Spooner in 1852. I enjoyed the whole book. And that would be good for a, 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 you know, an evening's lesson. Trial by jury, original program versus today. It, it's, a, it's a great bit of American history that we should know. He speaks about constitutions. Constitutions are utterly worthless to restrain the tyranny of governments unless it be understood that the people will, by force, compel the government to keep within the constitutional limits. Okay, we have to keep our government online. Have you ever heard anybody say, the Constitution guarantees our freedom, or something similar to that? Have you ever heard that kind of phrase? Yeah, pretty common, isn't it? Our Constitution, my Bill of Rights guarantees my... Do you own a Bible? Yeah. Does that Bible guarantee your attaining the celestial glory? No. Neither does the Constitution guarantee you anything unless you follow the principles in it. Same as the Bible. Well, he says constitutions are worthless to restrain tyranny unless you're willing to keep the people in charge within the limits of the Constitution. Practically speaking, no government knows any limits to its power except the endurance of the people. Now we're watching something phenomenal take place in the, across the country. Many state legislatures are now at the extreme of endurance and they will endure it no longer. And so they're doing things like suing the federal government for the Obama health care program. That's happening right now. There are like 18 or so attorney generals of states that are taking it to the federal courts. You can't do this to us. The endurance of the attorney generals and the governors and the state representatives is reached and stretched to the limit. Last year, and this will be next week's topic on Friday night at the Westlake High School, last year, not last year, in the last legislative session here in Utah, our legislators passed 12 resolutions and bills asserting state sovereignty, defying the federal government. That's pretty exciting. This gentleman right here believes, I have to side with Justice Stephen Breyer's view of the Constitution. 
but it is not a static, but rather a living document and must be read in the context of an ever-changing world. Now, the Constitution is a living document and must be read in the context of the ever-changing world means that as you change your whims, the Constitution's meaning will change. Do you believe this? These two gentlemen represent opposite viewpoints, I believe we can safely say. Stephen Breyer, the living constitutionalist, and Antoine, Antoine Scalia is what he calls, he named himself, an originalist. Now, I refuse to have anybody call me a conservative. That is a disgusting name to me because so many people don't even know what it means. And so they say, well, what do you consider yourself? My son-in-law says to me, well, Dad, you're just a little more conservative than I am. That doesn't mean anything. Conservative isn't a useful word. I liked Antoine and Antoine Scalia. You know, I have a hard time with that word. We'll just call him Mr. Scalia. I like his term, originalist. I believe in the original intent. Oh, well, that's irrelevant, people say. There's a book written, and that's one of the chapters. The Irrelevance of Original Intent by a law professor. The Constitution is a living document and must be read in the context of an ever-changing world. Contrast that to the other viewpoint. Most people think the battle is between conservatives and uh, the battle is conservatives versus liberals when it is actually originalist versus living constitutionalist. That's where the battle is. This is considered one of the great handbooks for understanding the original intent of the Constitution. That poor beat up copy was the book they handed me the night that I went to the old shop in Lehigh. Part of the fee that my neighbor paid for me was to get this book into my hands. And that cherished piece of literature is still with me. And you can see that I have at least drug it around in the dirt for a while and used it. It's great reading. However, I think it's next week we present the Anti-Federalist. It'll be next Friday night at the Westlake High School. We'll present and introduce the Anti-Federalist, and I'll bring a case of 50, and you'll find that there's another viewpoint that we need to consider also. Pardon? Friday night, next Friday night. We did it last night at the Westlake High School, just down the road a little ways. We're going to do it again next Friday night. We're going to take on the subject, state sovereignty, the original concept. It's probably the hottest topic of any of the messages that I deliver. Hot meaning the country is welcoming it. State sovereignty. In this, uh, last night one of the gentlemen came up and he said, my friend, and he says, Steve, it doesn't matter what kind of government we have as long as all the people are righteous. Well, that's a great idea, but they're not. <laughs> and they recognized this a long time ago. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing the government, oh, the first statement, I missed it. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. But they're not, and so government is necessary. Now, God had something special in mind for this country, and he raised up men with the purpose to create the best form of government that mankind could have for the greatest freedom, peace, and prosperity. That happened, but then we blew it. Our generations have not taken that and carried it on. We're not angels. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. Government is necessary. The sum of good government, however, is to leave men free to regulate their own pursuits. The best government is that government which governs least. Wow! If they only believe that in Washington, D.C. This is a beautiful stained glass window. I'm going to let it represent heaven on earth. Now, we're, we're not a... I hope we don't leave here too soon, then. You know, I'm not welcoming departing from this place yet. Uh, but this beautiful stained glass window representing God the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ, in contrast to this image here. Now, who does that look like? You don't know because you've never seen him before. But what do you suppose the artist had in mind? <laughs> yeah, that's the old deluder saying, isn't that great artwork? That was done in the year 1865 by Thomas Nast as he was trying to depict Satan whispering into the ear of John, Mr. Booth, who was about to assassinate Abraham Lincoln. It's a great piece of art. Well done. And, and Satan here has got smoke blowing out of his ears, and he's got these eyes that are, I don't know, light coming out of his fangs. Boy, that's one good old Satan. I'm sure he doesn't look like that. But the concept is that there is an evil force. There is an evil individual. There is a Satan. 
Now, I'm going to let these two images represent the opposite extremes of government on earth. Okay? Heaven on earth or hell on earth. Do you think of any society where they've experienced hell on earth? That's not too hard to do, is it? How about the other extreme? Can you think of any societies where they're presently experiencing heaven on earth? You know, in your own home you might be approaching it. It's pretty hard to find a government that's exercising the correct principles. Now we're going to move these two, uh, hell on earth and heaven on earth, off to the extremes, and we're going to draw a vertical line, and this is going to be our political continuum, and all the governments that are on earth can be put on this continuum, closest to heaven on earth and closest to hell on earth. And now let's see what we can get up here. Very limited government, freedom to choose the right. That's what I believe we'll find is going to give you the greatest blessing and joy and, and closest to heaven on earth. The socialist degrees are in between. Socialism is government's interference with man's actions. Government interference. Now, we won't go into the details there in a little later lesson. Absolute tyranny is the other extreme. Now we've seen governments that had absolute tyranny. I think of the Ukraine during the leadership of uh, Joseph Stalin, where Joseph Stalin was so brutal that he, he executed by starvation uh, roughly 10 million people in the Ukraine during 1933. Anyway, these are, these are the extremes. But the ones that are closest to heaven on earth, in my opinion, we can call originalist. They're going to follow the original intent of good government by the Constitution, the, the document that God helped us to create. The living constitutionalists are different degrees of a socialist, how much government involvement there is in the lives of the people, and what the, the fickle whims of the majority determine. And this statement may make more sense now. Mr. Scalia, most people think the battle is conservatives versus liberals when it is actually originalist versus living constitutionalist. See, we have these two contending forces. We have a few up here that are trying to bring us closer to heaven on earth. We have huge masses of people that want more something for nothing, and they're down in this area here. And then we have, again, the extremist on the earth with the tyranny in different parts of the world. What is a conservative? I, I hear the word all the time, every day, and I think maybe we should define it. So if you're going to be called a conservative, determine what that is. This is the definition from a great book by a great scholar in 1953, The Conservative Mind by Russell Kirk. His definition includes five points. If you are a conservative, you believe in an enduring moral order. Ever heard of the Ten Commandments, the Sermon on the Mount, the Golden Rule? These don't change. Thou shalt not commit adultery will always be there. It's always part of our moral order. Okay, you believe in an enduring moral order. You believe in strict adherence to the original intent of the Constitution of the United States. You believe in a free economy. You believe a mind our own business foreign policy. We do not need to take democracy to any more countries in the world. A, con a conservative believed war was the enemy of the Constitution, liberty, and economic security. Do you know that we have hundreds of thousands of American troops in 130 countries in the world today? We still have 78,000 troops in Japan, 60 years after they said they give up. We still have 28,000 troops in Korea, 50 years after they quit fighting. What are we doing around the world? Well. The conservative believes we should come home and not go out and be aggressors taking war to other countries. These two men were true con traditional conservatives. Now you probably all heard of the man on the right, Dr. Ron Paul. He's one of my heroes. I gave one of these lectures 30 years ago in Texas and Dr. Ron Paul attended. <laughs> What a joy to have the man in the audience. And then afterwards, someone said, would you like to come and visit with Dr. Paul? Well, yes, I did. And we had a great evening together afterwards in the home. Great, great hero. Dr. Larry McDonald, he's also a medical doctor. Most of you have never heard of him. Dr. McDonald was a Democrat. Dr. Paul was a Republican. They both served at the same time from 1973 to 19, I don't know what the numbers were now, 1973. They were both members of the House of Representatives. They both believed in the traditional values. They both voted constitutionally 100% of the time. One a Democrat and one a Republican. They were both friends. And I had the honor of taking Dr. Larry McDonald in my 
explain, to a speech he gave in Blackfoot, Idaho. So I flew him from Salt Lake City to Blackfoot, Idaho, and had a great evening with that gentleman. So two great heroes of America. Uh, Dr. Larry McDonald was murdered by the Soviets in 19, oh, somebody give me the date, 70, 83, somewhere right in there, when the Soviet Union decided to shoot down a commercial airliner on its way to Korea for no purpose or no reason, whatever. Unless it was to kill him, I don't know. Is conservatism dead? Now, these great conservative principles from 1953. Let's consider this man. I was the speaker at the Lincoln Day dinner three years ago in Ogden. And Senator Orrin Hatch came in. He was the first speaker. I was the concluding speaker for that evening. Senator Hatch declared, we should be grateful that we are being led by a great conservative president, George W. Bush. If that's conservatism, what is liberalism? See, see how difficult it is to sort out with the use of the term conservative. Here's what this man's track record showed. He delivered massive overspending. Is that a conservative principle? No. Biggest expansion of entitlements in 40 years, centralization of education, a floundering war, an imperial presidency that issued more than 1,000 signing statements. A signing statement is a statement where you say, part of this law I won't accept and enforce. So you just undid what Congress just passed. That's a signing statement. Civil, li civil liberties abuses and trillion dollar bailouts. And he was called a conservative. Well, perhaps conservatism needs to be redefined. This Defending Utah broadcast is brought to you in part by KTalk Radio AM 1640, Black Lotus Web Development, blacklotuswebdev.com, the United States Constitution Made Easy to Understand by Dr. Lonnie Crockett, available at the Defending Utah Liberty Store, Shem Financial Services, 801-856-6151, Trust Plumbing, 801-808-5470, Higher Calling Firearms, highercallingfirearms.com, Pioneer Family Scholars, American Appliance, 801-254-2566, and Anderson Accounting, 801-225-0396. It's a fact. More photos of you are being taken than ever before. Are you ashamed of your smile? At last, a new technology that gives a brighter and healthier smile in under two hours. And it's fully warranted, so you'll never have to worry about your smile again. Call Dr. Jeremy Thompson at Thompson Dental, 801-254-0835. Or visit GoNewSmile.com, and we'll show you how you can restore your faded, yellowed, or worn teeth without surgery, crowns, or implants. And it's backed by a 30-day, 100% satisfaction money-back guarantee. This scientific breakthrough will painlessly transform your appearance in one visit. The smile you've been waiting for will never cost less or look brighter than it will today. Call 801-254-0835 or visit GoNewSmile.com. That's G-O-N-U-Smile.com to revitalize your smile. New smile. It looks good on you.